The topic I thought that would be good that would work for Latin Americanists and those who are unfortunate enough to study the United States uh, might be a good comparison because it all begins with the Armand Verba classic work on the civic culture, which is where I began my work years and years ago. Um, so I want to show you some uh, questions here about how the United States is doing quite well in many areas and doing astonishingly poorly in other areas. And the first part of the talk where I show you the ways in which it's doing well are really an attempt for me to show you there's some validity to the data. USAID <laughs> is, a, is, a, is a core sponsor of what we're doing. The Inter-American Development Bank has been a partner of ours. I've been able to build Vanderbilt University for a small fortune of money uh, to support the project. The UNDP, Tinker is what, uh, the donations from Tinker have been very important because they've been allowed us to make the data public online and for free to the world. With Princeton, we work on this very controversial area of skin tone. We record the skin tone of every respondent and are able, therefore, to get a true measure of racism. And the entire 2012 study focuses uh, on the question of discrimination, gender discrimination, race discrimination. But I won't be getting into the skin tone stuff. The foundations that our own National Science Foundation, who's helped us with our post earthquake studies uh, in, in Chile and, and, and uh, Haiti. Uh, and the Brazilian National Science Foundation, and a whole bunch of other people, the World Bank and Duke on the work on, we're doing now in China, um, like you would do work on the military. So these are the set of donors that we have. But the project is much larger than the donors. We're a network of research institutions, universities, uh, throughout the Americas. Um, and I'm putting all those logos up there, not because I think you can, you know, you can read them all. This is with, with Ronald here with the Sao de Nacion in Costa Rica, and we recognize that one. We just came from the 20th anniversary of the surveys last week in, in Guatemala with their original partner, ASEAS. But in each country, we have a partnership of research institutions, like in this case, a think tank. In other cases, um, well, we, we have, a, we, like in Argentina, a university that's part of the tele. And that's our group there. Uh, the group has grown when we meet every two years. We do our surveys every even year for 2012. This was the meeting in late 2011. And that's, a, that's the group of people there that's grown quite large, so between 60 and 80 people in each round. Um, here's where we are at Vanderbilt. This is what we call Laptop Central. Once in a blue moon, we actually do. I allow people once a year to have a, a party, so um, the rest of the time I have to work. And these are all the current victims, or the graduate students of the program, um, as well as our, our staffers, the people who run our, our finances. Um, now my, my wife is giving a talk right as I speak now at CMU in the field of linguistics. She's in charge of our our violence mitigation program. The associate director is Liz Beckmeister. So we see people from, from, uh, from Brazil and from Colombia and from El Salvador um, and, and from Mexico and from Haiti and, and Spain and so on. They're both grouped with them out there. And we meet here. There's a series of the Vanderbilt has given us a beautiful suite of offices. We now have a conferencing center in the middle of that, with room for a dozen graduate students and um, about eight staffers who are, who are based there. And we're Skyping in there, you can see Ruby, who runs our Miami office at the University of Miami, is being Skyped into our meetings, talking about probably one of the presentations in our, in our surveys. That's our building there. Um, the early years was Costa Rica, in fact. That's where I uh, left from here to do my dissertation in Costa Rica. After we had spent two years in the Peace Corps there, it began with the only country where we could do surveys without endangering the respondent or the interviewer because of the human rights violations that the military governments were systematically committing both north and south of Costa Rica. Uh, it grew here, at, at, at when I came back as director of the Center of Latin American Studies, with a group we called the A-Team. There used to be a TV program at the A-Team, and we called these uh, people, and everyone went to different countries. No one wanted to go to Guatemala because they were too frightened, so I went to go to Guatemala. And all the others who stayed with us, the guy who did Panama, ended up marrying his interviewer, is now uh, Orlando Perez, and is now a professor of political science and chair of his department, and so on. These are the various people involved. But to fast forward to 2004, when I was in the process of leaving Pittsburgh to go to Vanderbilt, USAID decided that it was no longer appropriate to try to do ad hoc interviews about democracy and governance in which one questionnaire didn't match another questionnaire, the survey, the samples didn't match, they couldn't draw any large inclusions. So they started supporting a regional project. I'll skip to 2012. This is what it looks like today. We still have some embarrassing failures. We still can't distinguish between the ice and the people in Greenland. So the sample design isn't working very well. The more problematical one, of course, is the absence of Cuba. I still, even though they have been invited many times, maybe you guys can help 
can't have permission to do the interviews without someone from the committee, the Revolution Defense Committee, present in the household at the time. French Guyana is not included because it's um, uh, not an independent country. So in 2012, we had 26 countries, 41,000 interviews, 1,500 people per country, except in Bolivia where we do 3,000. Uh, you can talk about that if you want. The, um, the project then really does allow, for those of you who are talking about the political scientists interested in multi-level analysis, and then large enough at the level two to try to get a, you know, more than one variable there. Okay? So that's what, we're, that's what we're trying to keep this range. And it's very difficult because who wants to give us money to study Suriname in Guyana? It's a killer for us to get that money to do that. Okay. Um, just a figure that will make sense to political scientists here. The American National Election Studies, the famous Michigan surveys that began in 1948. Between 1948 and the current period, Michigan has interviewed 49,000 people in one country. But between 2004 and 2012, we've had to deal with this uh, that man, 178,000. So our project is big and complex um, in terms of managing the data. Um, the uh, differences between our surveys and a lot of the others you see around here is that we're the only ones in the hemisphere who do all of them, that you can use the US and Canada as, as uh, baselines to compare these. We do larger samples, most are down around 1,000. They're truly representative samples. For those of you who are not into sample design, these aren't samples of shopping malls. These are samples that are trying to represent the country, urban and rural. They're face-to-face -face except for the United States and Canada, where YouGov Polymetrics does web a sample of a sample for us, um, because we can't afford the four to $500 per interview that it would cost to do interviews in the United States and Canada. Um, we work in all the languages. When we did it in Suriname, we work in San Antonio, Dutch and English. We work in uh, Mam and Pachikel, uh, Kiche in, in, Port in Guatemala, um, Quechua and Aymara uh, in, in Bolivia, Quechua in Ecuador, and so on, to try to make sure that we don't exclude people because they speak languages other than the, the, the Spanish, or Portuguese, or English, or in, in, in Creole. Um, this is the hardest part of our work. We went through over 1,100 versions of the questionnaire. We are, as we speak, involved in trying to generate a 2014 questionnaire. And the biggest problem we have is we have less than an hour in the home with the respondent. We've got a lot to want to, want to know. And what do we exclude? That's our big problem. There's so many things we want to know. What do we exclude? And that's our effort here to, to decide. What, and that's why they go, we test and test and test using the methodology that actually came out of my doctoral dissertation for really not doing the standard pre test, but it's iterative pre testing, where we change and change and change until we get it. Right. Unfortunately, that sometimes excludes my own items, but that's what it is. I mentioned these are national representative samples, so this is a piece of cake. And you do work like this. You can look over Bolivia, the house is close by. It's easy to get to. This is hard, OK? That's fewer than five people per square kilometer. It's very costly using canoes and, 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 and horses and so on to get there. But it becomes a really problem. But we get We try to get a representative sample. Furthermore, those of you who might want to analyze the data need to know that the data are stratified and allow you, now that we develop this mapping system, allow you to look at things like this, okay, where you can break down, in this case, crime victimization and point out that it's not Guatemala as a meaningful number, but the region in Guatemala, and you can do that. In 2012, for the first time, we've now developed representative samples at the municipal level. Not all municipalities, obviously, there are nearly 300 in El Salvador alone, but we have a sample which represents the, um, the, the, these municipalities, and that's going to be fantastic for those who want to do cross time multi level analysis. We're going to have hundreds of units to work with. Um, when we do something like this in Argentina, you see the things that the, I thought were the tightest for all the government officials was going to be the most corrupt part. But it turns out it's the area where there's massive investment in tourism and, and petroleum going, and going in here to Patagonia. We see the same thing, by the way, the highest single area right now in Argentina of protests is in the same area where corruption is high. So that's the kind of thing you can do descriptively. Just to let you know how we carry out our surveys, here we are pre-testing in Honduras and Costa Rica. Often we have barriers that people don't, you know, they're frightened because of crime. Uh, and, and, and what makes our project unique is that we personally, we that is our staff, our PhD students, our former PhD students, train every one of the interviewers and use our sample design and our, thing, our training rather than just the kind of stuff that goes on in the commercial world, which uh, I can comment on. Um, this is what the samples look like. Those are the confidence intervals. Um, 
based on unweighted samples. What we always do, if you look at our work, we treat each country as 1,500 respondents, really because if we didn't, Brazil would end up, you know, the whole survey would just be Brazil and Mexico, because they would dominate the, the whole thing. And we want Costa Rica, Nicaragua, and Salvador, and Salvador, Haiti to count the same way that any other country. So that's our, our result. Finally, we'll talk a little about the technology here. We're a pioneer in using handhelds, originally with the palms, then with the Windows Mobile, and now our partners in Cochabamba have developed for us a wonderful um, Android-based system that allows us to change languages in the middle of the question. Okay, so you can switch right into from, you know, as you see in, when you're working in Paraguay, between uh, Guarani and Spanish, people code switch every minute to change the question. We can do all kinds of controls on this thing. We can embed experiments in here. We have no cases of pregnant men in these surveys of making mistakes, okay, if I'm asking the wrong question. We, we don't have skip questions, okay? People can say, I don't know, but we don't have pages of skipped items or and So it, it really has dramatically increased the quality when we compare this to the paper, which is astounded by how, how good this, uh, this really has been for us. Um, and finally, all this stuff is available to everyone in the world. You can go online, you can take our 2012 Gen Report, which is available as a printed book, um, and it should be shipped hopefully to the Pitt Library, as all have been uh, over the years. And you can download any of the particular studies all the way back as PDF files. <coughs> and we disseminate these things as broadly as we can. Here I am at Los, Los Andes and, uh, in, in, in Colombia, and we do things in the newspapers, report, whatever. You know, they always take some, you know, if it leads, it leads, they wait for some, some kind of thing. Um, and we have all kinds of partnerships. Those of you interested in following us, you go to this email address, you can subscribe to this. Every two weeks, you get an English and Spanish and Portuguese if it's on Brazil. A short, hopefully understandable, non-technical report. And this was a, on, on a, why is it that bribery is tolerated in the Americas? We have a partnership with the Americas Quarterly that publishes some of our jazzy results about tolerance towards gays and we assume about handicap and so on that we're dealing with. Um, and then you can go online uh, at the University of Costa Rica. That is through us. You can get the data sets with the standard engine behind it. You can use it for class purposes. You can have people find that if online. You can pull up the data and find out this is the crime victims by, by gender, and you can pull up what is here, uh, you know, simple statistics, or you can use OLS or logic if you want to construct measures right online. That's free, and we don't report people's addresses. And finally, now as a result of the Tinker donation, we're able to actually allow everyone in the world free to donate, to download the SPSS and standard versions. You go to our website, here it is. You go to the survey data, go to free access, Every week, by the way, we have a chart of the week that shows a, a recent finding in one of our surveys. You know, whatever the thing is, tolerance for gays or whatever we happen to have that week. And here's where you go. If you go alphabetically, Argentina, Belize, you find the year and the data set and the questionnaire in all of its languages, and you can just download them, okay? And the thing about the technical thing. So it's totally transparent uh, to the world. The libraries that retain their uh, subscriptions have the dead advantage of getting merged data sets and also getting all the static code. And finally, the thing that is, to us, the most expensive, the technical support. When you're online, people, I mean, all day and night, we get questions about, what about the Bolivia sample? How many, how do you weight that? So we can only do that for the approximately 100 libraries around the world that subscribe to our data sets. The rest of people, you know, you're on your own if you, if you don't subscribe. Um, let me get into the substance, America's upside down. Um, Let's talk about the classic civic culture. Um, Almond and Berber told us that you know, it was important for citizens to be participants, and we ask a straightforward question. People have problems uh, in their communities. They can't solve them by themselves. Um, in order to solve this problem, you know, did you contact someone in your legislature? Okay. And the US is way up there. For those who are interested in technical stuff, these gray bars are the confidence intervals. The point estimate is that bound. Okay. And so you see the US is way, way up there in countries at the bottom of this thing, contacting the legislatures down here. This will be the format I'll be presenting most of the stuff. So you'll see it statistically, not, not, you're not going to be statistically challenged with these results. Um, in order to solve a problem, if you talk to, talk to a, you know, a local you know, congress, a local uh, councilman and so on. The United States remains very local, all politics is local. Poorer countries have higher numbers here. Citizens are generating their own public goods, so we see, see this. Guatemala has a, both a community tradition and indigenous tradition, but uh, and Haiti has a set of problems, including the earthquake. They're very, very active people. Costa Rica, which used to have a very, very you know, important local
local government system. They did a series of reforms, including uh, local elections of mayors, and the system has deteriorated to Costa Rica is the lowest uh, in the Americas. That is, local politics have really been split aside from, split apart from national politics. The dramatic differences between seven up there and 22%. But it is, at the end, only 20% of people who contact their local, um, local officials. Um, here's attendance at town meetings, okay? Same down here, you get countries that are waived in the low end, and then you get a much higher um, city council meeting, so on, much higher, at around 20% in that set of numbers. He, a world leader. Okay, um, now let's talk about meetings of a series of, this is Putnam, and um, you know, people getting together in various groups. I just pulled out one, meetings of professionals, merchants, manufacturers, we have others, meetings of women's groups, PTAs, and, and municipal council, all kinds of groups like that are in there. So the U.S. remains there. Everyone, so you and Nadia, you know, that, that's, the U.S. should be there, it's very high, and so on, and that, that's, where, that's where it belongs. Um, okay, and then the question now about these, that we developed years ago, we started to this item with deceased um, years ago, and then Mueller, about the question about support for military coups. Yeah, and believe it or not, yes, there are people in the U.S. who support the extinction of democracy through a military overthrow. Okay, and that, you know, surprises people. For the three countries without armies, we had to use a substitute because we found over the years, we were shocked in Costa Rica that anyone would support a coup, and we actually did a whole series of focus groups and experiments, and they do know what a coup is, and they do support it. But we, since they don't have armies, we had to use these uh, different words here. But setting those aside, we have very high support in Paraguay, but it's actually only about a quarter of the population, okay? And it drops down into the 16 in here, and then finally in the United States. So once again, um, even though there are some people with some fairly strange beliefs, from my point of view, in the United States, about you know, we would support a coup on the condition of high unemployment, which is the condition we have today, um, it's very, very low. Giving you further confidence in the day. Okay, and what about the rule of law? In order to catch criminals, you think that the authorities can should abide by the law across the line. And we see again a law-abiding population here, something about the British system and Jamaicans down there, and then it goes down to Bolivia. But notice these numbers. The lowest on here was 53. That means in every case, the means are above, you know, we score these on a scores of 1 to 7 and 1 to 10. But here we've got really high percentages who are, you know, you know, belief in the in the uh, in the rule of law. Okay? And uh, compared to the other things we've seen. All right, going on. Um, how much confidence do you have that the system will catch the bad guys, okay, if you were uh, a victim of an assault or someone? So that's very high in the United States. It drops way down to the very bottom. I have a whole separate discussion in Costa Rica, and Ronald and I hope to do something soon in, in Costa Rica, um, because Costa Rica is going to hell in a handbasket. Um, in the, the survey, uh, it's the only, the, uh, the, other, the other country, by the way, others mentioned, actually, deep trouble, which doesn't surprise anyone, I don't think, in this room, is Honduras. Honduras has such extreme values in terms of negative values that it's hard to see how they can put it together there. And there'll be an insight series on that very shortly. So the United States, once again, I'm believing that with all the problems we've had, with the O.J. Simpson aside, the case aside, and Nelson support, strong support for that, that belief system. And finally, in terms of the military, we have a whole series of other presentations on this. We did one with the Pentagon. The most trusted institution in the Americas is the military, plain and simple. Yes, a public institution. The church, in some countries, is higher than the military. But the military beats everyone. People who remember that there was a time in which the military spent most of their time murdering and torturing their own populations in Latin America are surprised by this. Not Latin Americans. They think the military did a damn good job getting rid of the bad guys. And they, they are very, very positive. The country with the biggest military, the most expensive military, loves its military more than any other institution in the country. We're very high. So it means that we don't just distrust that we really have high trust in that public institution. Honduras, post coup, uh, have very low trust in their own military. They're at the bottom of the list. Here we do believe that countries that don't have armed. Uh, by the way, for those of you who are into regression, I can show you there is, there is a trend line that's not very strong. The bigger the military, the more trust, but that may be because people trust it, and therefore they give it a lot of money, or they give it a lot of money, and therefore they trust it. I don't even know what we can talk about that. Okay. We have a series called populism, okay, which is the extent to which people would be willing, essentially, to limit uh, 
liberal democracy as we know it. How much we do believe in the, 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 the presidents of countries should limit the voice and vote of the opposition. Okay. And this is the one that how is necessary at present to limit. So this is the negative side. Okay. Haitians are all prepared to limit um, the opposition. It's a very popular president. People in the United States are not prepared to do so. Okay. Is there anything in between? Notice how this goes from 20 to 50. Okay. So for the most part, people are reluctant to see um, a Chavez-style regime take power. Okay. And, and, um, and you, you see, interestingly enough, where Venezuelans are. Venezuelans are extremely supportive of democracy in the abstract and in practice. Okay. And it, despite the fact that they have a convicted felon uh, as elected president, you try to overthrow democracy, um, they, um, they, they, they're very supportive of it. Okay. Um, those, this is the second populism item. Those who disagree, these form a scale, by the way, those who di disagree with the majority represent a threat to the country. Okay. Haitians see people who disagree with them as threatening the country. The United States on this one, once again, does you know, pretty well. Um, yet nonetheless, you know, you got a number there, 27 out of our 0 to 100, but people think that if you disagree, you're a threat. Okay? Um, the lowest on this, Uruguay, which consistently scores very well in our surveys, and almost every democratic value um, has the you know, lowest percentage, you see that. Uruguayans are among the most tolerant on a whole range of items that we see. Um, changing the subject again, now this moves us away from that thing into more more social issues. The focus of our 2012 was on discrimination, and we asked the question about you know, men having the right to work. Okay, some say that when there's not enough work, <coughs> men should have a greater right to work than women. To what extent do you disagree or disagree? Notice we get up as high as 54 here, and down to 20. That is, even in the United States, there are people who think that men, when times are tough, ought to have you know the right to, to have a to have a, um, a, a job where it's Lose out. So it's nice to see that the numbers are on the, on the low end of this, um, of this thing. That's, that's helpful to see. Uh, Canada, the United States, Uruguay are, are way down here. And the Caribbean generally is the most um, machista and homophobic part of the world that we measure. Okay. Uh, doing this in Jamaica was quite an experience, telling the Jamaican you know, members of parliament, you've got a real problem, even though the president said, we will not have a gay in my cabinet, and he ended up having one. But it caused the Gleaner to be publishing this stuff for days and days about the homophobia of Germany. So that's for the United States. Um, talking about other topics, do you think that to interrupt the pregnancy, um, uh, that is an abortion, um, you know, are you supportive of that when the mother's health is in danger? Um, this is a subject that comes up a lot in the United States. Uruguay is even ahead of the United States, but not statistically significantly, but you see these companies in all that going all the way down to. Honduras on here, where it's down to 30 compared to 80. This is where the, the countries are raised. So there's really, really a strong variation uh, in these things. And it's interesting how, um, how these uh, items, you know, the, the spike of homophobia, Jamaicans are willing to, to see this. Um, now let's move to just a couple of items on tolerance. I mentioned to you that uh, Uruguay is a very tolerant country. And it's right up here. That is, there are the question, which is the D series, uh, D one through six. Um, there are some people who only say bad things about our form of government. How strongly should these people have the right to vote? Minority rights. Okay. If you don't like the people and they don't have the right to vote, how can they ever become majority? And you see, the United States is a top count is very high, and it goes down to a country which has had a really serious problem of late in terms of rights of minority. Down there, way below fifty. Down in that region. And, and if I were to show you, which I won't in this one, tolerance of Honduras has been going this way. Okay. The country is less and less tolerant with each passing year of minority rights, which is one of the things that gives us real concern about stability. Here's another one um, the, uh, the rights of these people to have to demonstrate. The United States is way up there, Honduras is way down there. Um, the other, another right. Should these people be allowed to run for public office? Same kind of pattern, the U.S. out there. So this should be giving you lots of confidence that the survey has some validity. If the United States, the quintessential democracy in the region, has a bunch of people who are highly intolerant of minority rights, you wonder what is, what is going on. You know, and the survey probably isn't valid. These are the rights of free speech. Same thing. The United States is at the very top. 
Honduran at the very bottom. And now moving in the series, we originally started with D1 through D4, but D5 has been added, the rights of gays. The United States, which has had this massive change in its, in its attitudes towards gay, is way up here, almost as high as, as, uh, as Uruguay and Canada. Argentina recently, which has changed some laws of support. And again, the Caribbean, Haiti is an extreme case of homophobia. Um, that they will not, they don't think that gays have the right to run for public office. I sort of don't get it, but that's the, that they clearly do. Okay. Um, um, and then same sex couples having the right to marry. That came out in this big headline stuff in America's Quarterly, okay, where the United States compared to its neighbors was way up here. So for those of you who are sort of frustrated by the problem of establishing rights in the United States, the number of states that have done so, you see that compared to a lot of countries in the Americas, it's way up here, and again, the Caribbean down at the bottom of the couple of lists. Okay, and that really surprised me, that I imagine the Caribbean as being kind of a laid back, open place, but not when it comes to these things. Uh, and the evangelical clergy there had a lot to say about my findings, I can tell you that, okay? Um, and then, uh, handicap. For the first time we added this item, um, and I was gratified to see how high the United States is on this. Disturbed to see that a bunch of people think that Roosevelt couldn't have been president, okay? That's what's in the <laughs> I mean, this is you know, another barrier that has to be overcome. But notice that you don't get to the negative point until you get down right to here to Guyana and Haiti. Everything else is mildly positive all the way up to here. Again, these are people admitting their things, okay? Maybe they really hold deep prejudices, but, they, but they, they're not. Uh, okay. Um, and we asked this item because of all Assange and what's going on in Ecuador, and not surprisingly, how strongly you approve of the state government having the right to pivot newspapers. So this is the negative side. The state should have the right to pivot newspapers from publishing. As you know, in Ecuador, the president of the country was after the lead newspaper in the country, fined them several million dollars. The editors wanted to put them in jail for, for 10 years. Um, that didn't happen but in the end, but uh, that's where it was. And you see that these numbers go as high as 36. That is, there's no country where you have averages above 50, so you have a resistance to that kind of censorship, okay? But the United States remains the most open, even though there are people in the United States who would uh, censor newspapers that are politically damaged. Um, and this is our uh, corruption series. We have a, do a lot on this whole area here. It is. Democracy can be a very corrupt system. It doesn't have to be clean. But it's interesting to see, again, in terms of validation, Chile, which is considered to have a squeaky clean system in the United States and Canada, this is the percentage of people who have been victims of corruption in the various areas. Um, the uh, uh, police officer, government employee, municipal bribery, work, um, courts, um, hospital and clinic, uh, and school. Haiti is up there in part because of school. Education is free, primary education is free, uh, and compulsory in Haiti. However, in order to get your kid to stay in school, you have to pay something to the teachers. Um, and so you have a, um, Haiti is the most, by our measure, the most corrupt country. The Andes tend to be very, Andes in Mexico systematically tend to be very corrupt, and it's down to these Uruguay and Jamaica. So Jamaica is the one country which has had a dramatic decline in corruption as a result of this big project on the part of the government to reduce corruption. Okay, um, now to talk about some of the negative side. You're all smiling, the, you know, you're all going to vote Republican in the next election because we are the, uh, you know, the quintessential democracy we always thought we were, except that a lot of people in the United States have lost their faith in the institutions. I know a lot of my colleagues in political study, science study institutions, and these institutions uh, have big problems in terms of public uh, acceptance of them. Um, let's talk about these items. Um, among the big stories here is whether or not people feel that the government listens to them. This is a classic item. Do you think the people in Washington listen to people like me? Okay, now that's a standard item that's been asked dozens and dozens of times. Are they paying attention? The big Chavez story, the reason why Chavez has been so incredibly popular is that he is a person who people think is listening. He may have screwed up on the problem of, of oil and, and inflation, and on, on uh, crime, but he listens. Okay. Here's where we are in these numbers. Venezuelans are overwhelmingly of the opinion, because it's a country that's split in any way, the Venezuelans think that you know, the man out there is listening. People in the United States don't think so. 
And the country that has a president who was apparently entirely tone deaf, what I always said is the best country in the world, and I'm still trying to hold to that, and I'm having a harder about it time doing that. My, my, my uh, Diego Costa Rica is down at the bottom, okay, in terms of political efficacy. Okay, a real, and this, by the way, is a dramatic shift from where it had been uh, decades earlier when we did the first surveys, okay, where people thought that, yeah, they were listening to me. We can talk about why that's the case and what's going on in Costa Rica. Um, and the other strange is this Venezuela. Tomás Canache, who also got her degree here, um, and I think got a stick in Latin American studies, who's now an associate professor in Illinois. Her surveys in 1995 had 92 percent of Venezuelans saying the government isn't listening to me. And now look. So that's really the explanation, it seems to me, for what if you want to be a popular president, whatever your politics are, let people know that you're paying attention. Another area is support, political support for the institutions themselves. Okay. The supposed mostly reserve or reservoir of will, of good will that people have. This is from all the way back in David Easton in his earliest measures of trying to look at the extent to which people believe in the legitimacy of the system. Okay, to what extent do you respect the political institutions of your country? This is where the United States is. Duke and now with Honduras, okay, <laughs> to the bottom of the heap. Okay, maybe the group plotters in the U.S. have something in common, I don't know. But it's right there at the bottom, okay? And notice, when we look at the 2006 results, this is the United States here. That is, it's hard for you to see the countries, but it was considerably higher up, and it's been falling ever since then. Okay, look at this side. To what extent do you trust the legislature? <laughs> you know, I mean, we sort of invented it all, and you know, and we were into representative government, you know, since the Greeks. And this is a, a pretty big thing. And there are people in this room who have spent a lot of their careers studying, you know, the legislature. Well, we certainly don't think much of ours. Okay. And the point here is that it's not that people say, well, they don't trust it anymore. It's, you know, it's bad. It's really, really bad when you put it into comparative context. I mean, the beauty of looking at the, the America's barometer, it seems to me, is that you can say to your people in Washington, hey, you guys are in worse shape than Haiti in Honduras. <laughs> what is going on? And the changes have been here. Here's where, where the United States was just a few years ago. And look at what it's going on now. So we have a country which is committed to key democratic values. I just showed you, and the data are valid. And if you get someone who says, oh, see, I don't like that number, you must have rousy surveys. Then you've got to explain why the other numbers look good, okay, that you like. So that's a thing here. So this is where the United States is. Um, to what extent do you trust political parties? No one likes parties, they're down there with dog catchers, okay? But we have Diana, Lisa, and Sarah, I'm up here, and the United States having a real tough battle with Paraguay on, on uh, you know, support for political parties. Once again, over time, the United States is falling, okay, compared to where it had been in the relatively recent past. Okay. This is, to me, a, much of a canary in the coal mine kind of situation. Something is really wrong. To what extent are you proud? Now, I mean, we have a, a country that has a long, glorious past, and you, number the, you notice these numbers start to go 96 to 79. There's no country that's not proud of its own nationality, okay? It is not in the hemisphere. Even so, among our partners, we're right there at the bottom of the list, okay? That, that, and that number is a number that has slipped, and if you look at the, if you compare this, if you can compare it directly with the earlier surveys going back, you'll see that it is, it's really, really taken a big hit, okay? The people not only losing faith in institutions, they're losing pride in their own national system. Yeah, it's, it's still a high number, so okay, it's not negative. Um, trust in the mass media. You know, I think that we have, I, mean, I think the New York Times remains, okay, the, you know, the newspaper, I mean, we debate that stuff, okay, but look at how this number goes down to 30 compared to the Dominican public, okay, where it is down here. Now, the Canadians are also quite skeptical. We wonder whether this is a symptom of advanced industrial democracies. Maybe our time has passed and, and um, the Dominican public will lead the way to the future. But, um, but the United States has got a, you know, it's, it's an order of magnitude below any other country in the region and, and far below the newspapers of Honduras, which I can tell you are not uh, near the New York Times in quality. Okay. Um, 
Then dealing with the administration itself. This now focuses on the incumbent more than anything. To what extent do you say the current administration promotes and protects democratic principles? In that one, the U.S. is near the bottom, having fallen from where it was before. It's right next between Guatemala and Paraguay. And, and Paraguay. Uh, to what extent do you say that the current administration has managed the economy well? That's an endorsement or lack thereof of the Obama policies. Okay, that's pretty clear where we are on that one. The 30s compared to Uruguay, which is up at 60. Um, and here's the overall measures of a series of items that created a scale. Okay, improve citizen safety, combat corruption, democratic principles, and fight poverty. And the United States is right down there, right next to Costa Rica, which is people are feeling the same thing and right there. So this is the class that we're in a group of countries, Honduras, Paraguay, and the current Costa Rica, which is um, in really, really bad shape. Okay. And then just an overall evaluation of presidential performance. I need I say more. Okay. The lowest in the Americas. The least popular president in terms of that standard item. How would you rate the performance of the president? Okay. The lowest in, in the Americas. Uh, Korea, by the way, with one election is you know, also very effective in his getting his message across. Let's move to these items, which is the Ross series, Role of State. Here we have some really fascinating findings. We find a consensus view in most of the Americas, except for the United States, basically, and except for our closest partner, Venezuela, <laughs> in belief that, uh, the, in this ROS-1, that the government should be doing private public sector things. That is, the country, that is the United States, El Salvador, the South governor of Salvador, Instead of the private sector, it should own the most important enterprises. Now, you know that Venezuela has been doing exactly that, that is under Chavez, which suggests that people like Chavez, but they don't like Chavismo. They like him, but not his policies. Okay. Because the United States and Venezuela are of one mind. They really sharply diverge from the rest of the region, which tends to have very much higher support for what we call our socialist items. But look at our welfare items. The government of Paraguay, more than individuals, should be primarily responsible for ensuring the well-being of the population. That is not the role. This is clearly the quintessential America. It should be the people, the private sector, not the government. And this is where it is in the other countries. So there's sort of a valence item here. People think that the government should play that role, except the United States, and here we are in Canada. The country, more than the private sector, should be primarily creating jobs. In the middle of our most serious you know, crisis that we since the Depression, People don't want to see the U.S. government involved in creating jobs. We live in a different universe from our, people, our colleagues in Latin America. They feel that the government should play an important role in producing jobs. Um, okay, and then this one, which is the one percent issue. Okay, the redistribution issue. Should the government be implementing strong policies to follow, you know, the George Soros and the other billionaires who said we've got to change this problem? The answer in the U.S. is. No, it's not a strong no, it's 47, whereas it's very strong in the rest of the Americas, okay? So in that regard, um, we are different. And I'm, here, I'm not saying the United States is falling apart. Here, I'm saying the United States has got an ideological difference from most of the people in the Americas. Um, and this one about health care, because it's very relevant to where we are in the Obamacare period, is a, a strong consensus across all these countries that it should be the government, not of the United States. Um, and then um, we deal with this generalized item. It's just how satisfied are you with the way government works, democracy works. I actually don't like this item because it has the word democracy in it, and democracy means a million things. During the Pinochet regime, whenever I traveled there, people said we have the strongest democracy in the Americas. So, you know, whatever people mean by it. But the United States is up here. The United States on this dissatisfaction item has been going downhill. Okay. Now we deal with the underbelly of this thing. Here are some actions. We talk about participating in clubs and organizations, but here's the underbelly. What a, how much would you approve of people seeding private property or land in order to protest? <coughs> the United States is surprised. When we did this before, there was practically no one in this group that was willing to talk about support for that. And now it's up here. Okay. You know, sort of minute men and, and uh, philosophy. It's only 20 out of a scale of 0 to 100. Okay, and it uh, goes way down here to 10% in these countries. Um, here's this one. People participating in 
this is as clear as you can get to in support for insurrection. People participating go to violently overthrow an elected government. So from 0 to 100, low, it's 20. But look at how high it is compared to the others in the region. Uruguay is way down here. The United States is way up here. Okay? And the United States has increased since uh, the 2008 version pretty strongly. Okay? The numbers have gone up uh, from where we were here. Here is ranking has gone up. So it's small. I'm not claiming there's insurrection tomorrow, but I'm claiming that there's a lot of angst going on in the U.S. system that would get people to talk about the overthrow of an elected government. Um, this item about political parties, can you envision a democracy without political parties? The numbers are very high in the United States. Most people can envision a democracy without political parties. Okay? They're way up here okay, compared to Costa Rica, which is way down there. Um, and now finally, what policies specifically? Here we have the affirmative action policies. This is, I think, a good way to put it. Universities ought to set aside openings for students, even if it means excluding others. So you, you bring in a minority, and that means you may have to exclude the majority. We've had the longest and, and, and most effective affirmative action program in any country in the hemisphere, but support is at the very bottom. Okay, so sort of, you know, don't, you know, don't, you may get what you ask for, wish for, rather. That is, the United States has, a, has policies like this, and they're not supported. Um, okay. Uh, how important is religion in your life? This surprised me, because I thought the United States was way up here. These numbers have been declining, by the way. But the United States, I thought, was going to be very top. But religion actually remains a very, very important part in Latin America, much more so the United States, which itself is an outlier compared to Canada and compared to Europe, where these numbers are extremely low. That's the last of the, of the information. I've drowned you with lots and lots of